Lecture 19, Nationalism. Ladies and gentlemen, in the next few lectures, we'll be concerned with some challenges to the political mainstream of a rather different kind. Ones that relate to identity and to demands for its public recognition. One of the strongest ways in which identity plays a role in politics relates to nationalism. And I think that this is a good topic on which to get to grips with just the kind of power that ideas connected with identity can have. To understand nationalism and attitudes towards it, one needs to understand something of its history. There has been, I guess you could say, a long history of ethnic and religious revolt going back to the Maccabees in ancient Judea. But nationalism in the modern sense involves various different and really quite distinctive strands. First of all, there was a cultural reaction against the ideals of the Enlightenment. What was the Enlightenment? Well, it was an intellectual and political movement in the 18th century which was concerned to diffuse knowledge and it preached a doctrine of rational reform, uh, often from the top down. It was highly cosmopolitan in its character. It was international in its character. Links were made between people in different countries who were attracted by its ideas. And against this, and against the sort of reform that it favoured, one had a reaction. This reaction stressed, first of all, feeling and community, as opposed to the themes of reason and individualism, which had been connected with the Enlightenment. Second, there was an emphasis in this reaction on distinctive national cultures, on countries' own traditional law, on their own traditional language, and on particular national customs and traditions, which were contrasted with the Enlightenment's concern for a uh, rational improvement to language uh, on a kind of uh, law uh, which was tidied up and made sense of. Indeed, this sort of reaction is something with which you're likely to have an everyday familiarity. For example, recall Grimm's fairy tales. What was this all about? Well, basically, Grimm's fairy tales were gathered together by two German nationalists, the brothers Grimm, who went out and talked to a whole lot of elderly people, peasants and so on, and just got from them various folk tales that were told in their areas, and they then wrote them down, and that's what Grimm's fairy tales was all about. And so one has, uh, in this area, the gathering of folk knowledge of different kinds, linguistic knowledge, knowledge about folk songs and fairy tales and so forth. A second influence that goes into the making of nationalism comes from the 18th century political philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, born in Switzerland, uh, spent much of his life in France. He stressed the way in which you could interpret political liberty as involving the decisions of a single sovereign body of all citizens, where they as a body, at least formally, pass laws which will apply just to themselves. Indeed, his view was that if you impose laws on yourself rather than someone else imposing laws on you, it means that you can have order without your freedom being compromised. And he offered this picture as one which allowed for government but without a compromise of people's freedom, namely if you give uh, laws to yourself. Indeed, the political idea developed of autonomy and freedom as being something that involved self-government. It was developed in the background to, to these ideas in connection, first of all, with individuals. The individual was thought to be free if he or she was in control of himself, if he governed himself or if she governed herself. And then this idea was applied to nations. 
the result was a powerful idea, namely that a nation is only free when it governs itself, that if you're governed by someone else, however good that government is, you're not free. But what, one might ask, was a nation? Here, actually, different people came up with various different ideas. Some people said that what really characterizes a nation is that it has a common history. Other people stressed that it had a common language. Some others that it needed common religion, or that there should be a territory that shared, or there should be a wider culture that all of the people who form one nation share, or possibly there may be reference to a particular ethnic background. Within these different ideas about what makes for a nation, one might, I think, distinguish between uh, two interpretations. There's one view which you could call, as it were, an objective view, and that is that a nation is, as it were, a matter of fact. It may be fragmented and may require nationalist ideas to revive it, but basically it's something that is there, distinguished by the kinds of things that I referred to earlier. By way of contrast, one might refer to a subjective view as an, of a nation. Namely, from this perspective, a nation is something that is created by people coming to have a shared sense of identity and common ideals, where this view is compatible with the idea that what unites them has in some sense to be made or to be created. It's not, as it were, just a matter of fact. It's something which people take on, become inspired by, and that's what, that is what creates the nation. Nationalism made a considerable political impact. First of all, in the 19th century, it became a powerful base for the development of objections to multinational empires. People, for example, who were under the sway of the Ottoman Empire, the Habsburg Empire, the Russian Empire became more and more restive with those forms of government, insisting really that if they were going to be free, they had to rule themselves. It also served to offer the basis for the formation of new national countries, such as Italy and Germany, which, as it were, were gathered together and created out of various kinds of fragments on the basis that these different fragments shared in some sense a common nationality, although they may have had historically uh, very, very different uh, histories in, of, in terms of how they were governed. Later, into the 20th century, nationalism provided a basis for revolt against various colonial empires, for example, the empire that Britain had. Currently, other multinational governments are under pressure. There is, say now, very, much, very little left of Yugoslavia, and Indonesia, another multinational government, is coming under all kinds of nationalist-inspired pressures for separation. The political character of nationalism itself varied. Initially, in its early stages in the 19th century, it was typically liberal in its character. Uh, countries which wished to break away from the older ma multinational empires often were inspired by liberal ideas and by a vision of the world as consisting of a number of different liberal nationalist states. In the mid to early 20th century, early to mid 20th century, Italian fascism and German national socialism gave nationalism a bad name. Conservative governments quite often used nationalism as an internal weapon against socialism. They might invoke uh, socialism and socialist internationalism as bad and rally uh, support for themselves on the basis of invoking nationalist ideas. While after World War II, there were various nationalist revolts against colonial empires, which often made use of socialist rhetoric. So in this sense, it's been linked to many different things. There has recently been a revival of people who are again taking positive views about nationalism, some of these writers stressing very strongly its compatibility with liberalism, 
and others looking at nationalism as a realization of ideas about popular sovereignty, that in a sense uh, the nation seen as the population as a whole should uh, be free and be able to make judgments. Let's turn now to some assessments. In the middle of the 20th century, there was a whole body of criticism of nationalism. It's useful sometimes to note the background of the critics. Sometimes for people such as Karl Popper and Friedrich Hayek were people who had emigrated uh, to Britain from Austria. And some people have said, well, their uh, anti-nationalist views may have been influenced in some ways for a kind of nostalgia for the Habsburg Empire, uh, which in its later stages is quite uh, liberal in its character. And they think that maybe this image has kind of influenced their uh, lack of warmth towards nationalism. Sometimes, as in the case of Eric Hobsbawm, the historian, their views are influenced by Marxist internationalism. Uh, Hobsbawm was very much a Marxist. Uh, he wanted to stress the importance of solidarity amongst working people across different national barriers. However, while this may, in terms of the individual biographies of these people, be significant, I think that the arguments that they offered have to stand on their own feet. Typically what they did was to admit that nationalism was powerful and to say, yes, it draws on very deep emotions, but they argued that it's problematic in its character, not least because when they wanted to claim what nationalists invoke doesn't really exist. For example, they wanted to argue that in virtually no case is there a single nation in the sense of a group which has a shared culture and a shared language and shared ethnicity which actually works geographically as a state. So they wanted to claim that the different criteria that nationalists appeal to may indeed be very different and may pull in different directions. Also, and this is a point that the historian Hobsbawm made, his argument was that nationalism typically relies upon bogus history, that nationalist history is one that sort of plays up the significance of certain things that more sober historians would say, well, you know, I'm really not sure that it worked like that. And more generally, critics will often say that it leads people to become dissatisfied with what, in other respects, are perfectly good governments. That's to say you may have a country that is well administ administered and so on, where nationalists say, we're not free under this. And you, if you ask why, it's really because it doesn't fit with nationalist ideas. Further, the critics have argued that under a nationalist regime, there are a whole bunch of problems. First of all, there are typically so-called national minorities. That's to say, not everyone under a political regime will actually be a member of the nation in question. And the critics stress, first of all, that the position of such people is difficult. In particular, their position is very difficult as compared to what their situation might be under a multinational empire. It's much easier under a multinational empire because that can much more easily accommodate diversity. By way of contrast, the nationalist regime is typically committed to a program of political and cultural nationalism. It wants its own political institutions recognized. It wants its own culture recognized. In this situation, what are national minorities to do? Well, some of them may say, well, you know, we now have our own nationalist case for independence or for union with some other nation where we are in a, mi a majority. There is, the critics might say, but you know, even if that happens, of a danger of further national minority problems. I mean, suppose some particular group gets independence. Well, it is also likely to have a national minority within it and so on, a little bit like sets of Russian nesting dolls, where inside one doll is another one and another one and another one. I mean, does it ever stop, the critics would say. What's more, if such people aren't separate from the nation state, their rights within it are often going to be problematic. They may find that they themselves become second-class citizens. 
They may find that their language is discriminated against, that their religion isn't properly recognized, and they may also be seen as people who are potentially disloyal, as people who really you can't properly trust just because they're not really properly part of the nation. In more recent years, though, some arguments have been offered for nationalism and against those older criticisms. And I'm going now to discuss some of these. I'm going to draw some arguments from the Czech-born sociologist and philosopher Ernest Gellner, who I guess is really more offering a kind of uh, sympathetic explanation of nationalism than advocacy for it. And I'm going also to draw on the work of a British political theorist, David Miller, and the Israeli political theorist, Yale Tamir. What I will do is to draw upon their different views to present a kind of composite defense of nationalism. First of all, I think they'd say, look, nationalism doesn't really deserve the bad press or the hostile treatment that it received in the mid-20th century. Why? Well, first of all, and this is an argument made by Miller and by Temir, it can be liberal in its character, and they go out of their way to argue for the compatibility of nationalist ideas and liberal ideas. Second, they argue that it can make appropriate provision for minorities. Temir here uh, drew uh, upon the idea um, that had been well known within political science that's often referred to as consociational democracy. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the idea is that if you have a society which is diverse, each bit of that society has appropriate state provision reserved for it. So, for example, if there are various uh, different languages spoken, you will have a state provision uh, for the encouragement of those different languages in ways that are proportional to the number of people who speak the languages. Uh, you may sometimes, within such societies, have a certain number of seats in Parliament or the equivalent of Congress or whatever, uh, which are reserved for members of particular minorities. Um, you, you may have, uh, in some cases even, a certain number of jobs in the public service reserved from people from one background or another background. And it's argued by Tamir that if uh, a particular group um, is living within someone else's nation state, as it were, they can uh, have accommodation made uh, for their needs by way of these sorts of devices. Whether in a background of nationalism they would really find this acceptable but, you know, is, I guess, open to dispute. But at any rate, she offers this kind of argument. Also, it's argued that one might be able to build in ideas about what makes for a viable state so as to limit demands for national self-determination to what would amount to viable, moderate-sized nation-states. Indeed, nationalists today might argue that, uh, at the moment, uh, some really very, very small states uh, have, seen, have shown themselves to be viable and are members of the United Nations and so on. Um, and so this uh, requirement of viability uh, may not be a particularly arduous one. A second broad line of argument that has been offered is that national sentiment is needed in order to make a modern state function well. What kind of things do they have in mind? Well, they might say, for example, that for politics to function well, you need people to be socialized into a shared culture and within which citizens have more than purely pragmatic ties to one another. That's to say, you have the idea that for a community to work well, for a nation to work well, people should be tied to one another by more than just the feeling that this is a kind of useful arrangement. They should feel some commitment to one another. And this, it's argued, is something that can be handled very well by means of a moderate, liberal, nationalist approach. Further, they would say, you can't really make very much sense of the idea of a state if you treat it simply as a kind of mutual benefit organization. That's to say, they might claim that one can't understand the state's call on our loyalty. 
and of our obligations to the state that one can't explain what citizenship really means or why you have the immigration regulations that you do if you think of a state as being purely pragmatic. Rather, something more is needed and that more, in their view, is provided by nationalism. In addition, while they might agree that in the past nationalists might have exaggerated or told, told uh, slightly dubious history, they would say there are typically, in any particular nation, elements of a shared history and of a shared culture which can be drawn on in order to foster a shared identity, and that this can then be reinforced by way of public education. Why? Well, they stress that we gain by way of having a strong national identity. In terms of individuals, it serves to provide each particular individual with a strong identity in the sense of a strong feeling of who he or she is. It also allows the opportunity for public celebration of the nation, but also of a shared identity, something that it's argued is really appreciated, particularly by those people who haven't had it. And in that context, um, you find, for example, some Israelis, I mean, really getting very excited about the possibilities that Israel has allowed for the celebration of a public identity, of, of, you know, that it's ours, they might say, in a way in which, if they're living as a, as a minority in other countries, wouldn't have been available to them. Think also of kind of uh, uh, patriotic occasions in the US and its importance to people. It's also argued, for example, by David Miller, that nationalism offers a moral basis for the welfare state, in particular for explaining why it's okay to treat citizens differently from non-citizens. This actually relates to a quite interesting problem, because often one thinks of morality in universalistic terms, that in a sense, all men or all women should be treated the same. Now, if you think that, then what is the rationale for the welfare state? In virtue of what do, do we pick out our fellow citizens and or uh, permanent residents for special obligations or special entitlements? Nationalists answer, it's a matter of shared nationality. And indeed, that shared nationality as an element in our individual identity which explains these sorts of ties. And indeed, you'll sometimes find in this context people who take nationalism seriously being somewhat critical of people who are perhaps permanent residents in a particular country but who don't become citizens. In addition, there's an argument, and this is something to be found in Gellner's work, that you have the idea that nations may need to be constructed. We need, some nationalists claim, a shared language, a national institutions, and a shared culture in order to handle industrialization, modernization, and, develop, and development. This, historically, they claim, has been provided by states. And as a result, they say, states, if they wish to be modern, have to create a nation, have, in a sense, to forge these things so that they can really then become modern nation states. How might critics respond to all of this? Well, I think that they could say, look, we think nationalism actually really deserves its rather bad press. I mean, for example, critics often say nationalism fosters war. I mean, that's to say it will often create something that people be, will be willing to fight for, my country, right or wrong. And one might think in this context of the recent conflicts in the Balkans. I mean, the way in which these, the difficulties there have really been heightened by nationalist feeling. It may also, the critics urge, give rise to what one could call a politics of unreconcilable principles. For example, as I understand it, uh, Serbians often have a deep attachment to Kosovo because of the role that some of the uh, area there played in their own history. Accordingly, they're blocked, as it were, from coming to a, a simple pragmatic compromise about who should be ruling there. Similarly, it seems to me that one can look at the different attachments to Jerusalem between the Palestinians and Israelis. I mean, the problem here really is that nationalist sentiment 
particularly in this context also linked in with religious ideas, has made any kind of practical compromise in this area extremely difficult to reach. There are also, I think the critics would say, some, some tricky problems about what the relations are between nations and states. They might say, look, if a nation can be a creation somehow of the state, the, the underlying ideas of nationalism, I mean, that's to say the idea that uh, a nation somehow needs a state, seem, seems just to be bizarre. I mean, the whole thing starts to make little sense. Or alternatively, I mean, if you see the whole business as being a matter of cultural creation, what one has to say is, right, what you then have to do is to argue the case for nationalism purely on the basis of its practical merits. I mean, rather than appealing to it as something natural or whatever, what you'd have to do is to say, OK, you know, what would be the pros and cons of sort of trying to create strong national feeling and to weigh that up? And it seems to me that nationalists seldom like to do this. And indeed, the critics would press this and to say this would seem to introduce a degree of artificiality into things that doesn't actually fit too well to how they've usually seen them. Another response on the part of critics might be to say, OK, look, you may need certain things in common in a particular country, but why not restrict socialization, uh, what everyone has to have in common, just to what is needed in order that government will operate and limit what is ceremonial and so on, just to what's formally connected with government, and thus to things in a way which, if there is a lot of cultural diversity, don't actually have that much cultural significance. Because the idea is that if you minimize what plays that role, then you're not likely to generate big problems about cultural differences and national minorities. What, finally, about the justification of the welfare state? Well, there's an interesting problem about how the kind of discrimination that's involved in this is to be justified. But I'm not so sure, I think critics would want to say, how this relates to our subjective feelings of identity and obligations towards others. I mean, for example, in the US today or in Australia, people's subjective ties may actually be much stronger across national boundaries. For example, with uh, people who've emigrated to other countries or something of this kind, than they may be within the nation itself. What also about the theme of nation building? What about that line of argument? Well, I think here the critic could say, you know, it's a disputed point, just how active the state needs to be. I mean, in a sense, commercial society, commercial relations seem well able to handle communication and coordination problems on their own. After all, much that nationalists does, don't much like about globalization seems to consist of the development of commercial societies and links across different states. It doesn't seem as if nations are, and nation states are needed to create this. It seems to be going on sometimes against the wishes of those very states. Let's now review what all this has amounted to. We have explored, first of all, some of the distinctive ideas about freedom which were involved in nationalism, the way also in which they called into question the legitimacy of multinational empires, that people, if, if people were living under multinational empires, if they took on board the powerful ideas of nationalism, they then thought that these were illegitimate. And indeed, these ideas really were extremely powerful, and we have seen them over history used for a variety of different political purposes. They started to look highly problematic in the light of fascism and national socialism, and were strongly criticized by certain people just after the Second World War. They claimed often that those ideas weren't coherent, that particularly objective nationalist ideas made little sense, and generated problems about national minorities. More recently, there has been a revival, and in particular, a revival of nationalism by theorists of liberal nationalism, arguing that nationalism is useful, and also that it's compatible with liberal ideas. For these views, it's been argued that they can play an important role, both in relation to identity 
and in relation to the welfare state. Against these ideas, it's been argued, however, that they lead to bellicose attitudes and, to need, and that they needlessly create irreconcilable difficulties, for example, out of symbolic disagreements, while the problem of national minorities doesn't go away. Indeed, the arguments about nationalism continue, and they're getting even more lively these days. However, one might say, well, isn't there a sense in which this stuff makes more sense in the context of European and Asian countries than in diverse settler-based countries like the US, Canada, and Australia? And it's the problems that have arisen in those countries which will be our concern in the next lecture on multiculturalism. Thank you.